I, I now want to, invi to invite Gashe Lankola to comment on Michel Bigbo's piece. Actually, His Holiness this morning already responded what I'm supposed to say. So in a way it was wonderful. But I need to fill my space. So to begin with, I would first of all like to you know, congratulate this university, which is one of our most important universities where you have all the traditional as well as modern learnings. It's a very happy occasion. And I would like to greet all the scholars on the dais, as well as the wonderful participants. The paper that I was given to respond was such a complex, difficult paper. Number one, I was traveling and didn't get time to read. And uh, then when I tried to read a little bit, it has, believe me, it has quantum physics, it has philosophy, it has metaphysics, you know. So I, my head almost burst out just by reading the first few pages and then I said, okay, stop. Then luckily from the airport, I happened to be traveling with Professor Bitball. <laughs> so I said, please, <laughs> you know, uh, make my job easy, you know, say something, you know, tell me something. And then I also had the pleasure of listening to him this morning. So I do have some cautions and observations. Some may be related directly to the paper and others may be general kind of uh, doubts that I have. So number, the first question was uh, this borderline between metaphysics and uh, physics. Because according to my little knowledge, the Western science is in the beginning part of Western philosophy, which has a lot of metaphysics. And for me, it looked like that some great thinkers, they said, okay, let us forget about this meta thing. <laughs> Let's get rid of this word meta and talk about physics. It looks like how physics came into being like that. So which is primarily dealing with the physical reality, which makes sense of it. But then now, after reading this paper and also even otherwise, we, we do hear from many scientists uh, giving the impression that the, that the border between the science and philosophy and especially metaphysics is very blurred borderline. So I wanted to, just for sake of my knowledge and for the benefit of the listeners to, to hear whether such kind of strong involvement of metaphysics is allowed in science or not. So that, that's my kind of Question. Then second, another observation when listening to you this morning was your explanation about the universal consciousness. According to the, the Buddhist philosophy, we do say that in general there is a consciousness, in general there is an individual, there is a person. But that does not mean to say that there is a consciousness which is looming large on each and every individual consciousness. We say that in general there is a consciousness because you are in general, you know, this particular consciousness is in general consciousness, therefore there is a general consciousness. This particular individual is an individual in general, therefore there is in general an in individual. Apart from, there, we don't say that there is a, you know, a one consciousness or one individual which is looming large on each and every consciousness or each and every you know, individual. So this was one observation that I would like to make. And then also this morning that, that you mentioned something like when we talk about individual, it is just, just a group of sensations, you know. And, and, uh, uh, but, but from this viewpoint, none of the, the, the my, I, when I talk about myself, I talk about, you know, 
my body or my mind, then I say, this is my body, this is my mind. Clearly saying that the, your body and your mind is your, your characteristic, your feature, what, yeah. what you own. Meaning that you as an individual is the owner. So owner cannot be the same to, to what you have owned. So apart from the body and mind, there is a, there's, there's a separate individual. Now if you, if you ask me what, what is that individual, yeah. then strictly from the, the Madhimika viewpoint, everything is just a name, a designation. Now, that doesn't mean that you designate, give a name and make everything happen, you know. I cannot just imagine that I have billion dollars in my pocket and then I become you know, rich overnight. We are not saying that, but still, there's this very interesting understanding that the important role played by the name and designation on certain things. So that was another observation that I had. And then another thing was this, this related to this very topic, this uh, Schrodinger skate. According to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, the cat in that box with poison or whatever is both dead and alive. And I need a little bit more understanding about that because from the Buddhist viewpoint, whether you know something or not is a different thing. But you cannot say that it is both dead and alive. Because through the Buddhist process of finding the truth, we also use certain skeptical reasonings or doubts. For example, we use three types of doubt, doubt tending towards what is not fact, doubt tending equilibrium, doubt, and doubt tending towards the fact. So if you don't know what, what, what has happened to the cat in the box, probably you would have that doubt and thinking the cat may be either dead or alive. But you would not say that cat, cat is both dead and both alive. So that, that is like, for me, <laughs> at a very superficial glance, a very stupid comment. <laughs> But, but that may be because of my ignorance, you see. And that, that there may be probably a reason for uh, Schrodinger to, to not, not to accept it, you see. And then related to this is the, uh, uh, this, this, this question of many, many questions related to the wave particle duality, quantum entanglement, you know, uh, so many of these things. So for this, one thing that I wanted to mention was uh, Probably this whole topic is related to the, the, the gap between appearance and reality, which is a very important topic dealt in the Western philosophy and also in the Buddhist philosophy. Appearances are said to be deceptive. His Holiness this morning mentioned about the conventional truth and the ultimate truth. So the conventional truth in a sense is deceptive. Appearances are deceptive. Even though it is deceptive, there is no other way but to live with this deceptive world and deal with it. So this is something that I cannot like talk about here. You know, it needs such a lot of time. So now the, the, the key question is, how can you move from that deceptive world to the world of the ultimate truth so that you are free from all these you know, turbulences of negative emotions and so forth. So there's a very, very important and challenging question to all of us. So therefore, I, I'm near almost like uh, concluding, so please don't use your stick, okay? So, <laughs> here's a stick with his hand. I'm a little bit scared. So, now according to the Buddhist philosophy, you know, the different Buddhist standard systems, they explore the, the ultimate truth, and in their own way they found the ultimate truth, and then they are quite happy right now. So with the mother makers, they say we found the ultimate truth, which is Shunyata. Now what is, what is needed is meditation, actualization, but we know this is our final goal. Now in the case of the, the quantum physics or physics, there was a point, you know, of the time when, for example, especially during the, the classical physics or classical science, that you are searching the nature of those subtle particles with the hope that one day you'll be able to find a particle which you will say, this is the smallest, this is the fundamental building block, we found it. That's what you wanted to say. Is this still true? That's what you are trying to look. And of course you already, you know, uh, I think you've already made the bumper the wave particle duality. So how are you going to proceed further? Are you still looking for a fundamental building block or what are you searching? And then, as many people ask these days, through this search, 
if you, let us say, if you find something like an ultimate truth or shunyata, whatever, you name it, if you find something like that, what after that? How would that transform your life? I think this is a very critical question. Because the problem that we are facing today, when we talk about the appearance and reality is, all the technological products that we are seeing today is obviously related to the scientific thinking, scientific mind. But the technological products are you know, coming out in the market, flooding the market and to such an extent that to me it looks like that on the one hand we talk about quantum physics, you know, emptiness. At the same time you're, you're fortifying, strengthening the, the level of appearance so that everybody gets stuck there become immobile. That's actually what is happening. So how, how would we, if we want to reduce, you know, regulate our negative emotion or things like that, how are you going to deal with this fortification of the sensual objects where everybody is struck? So then I stop. With, 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 with one word, one word, one word. <laughs> this is very important words. And this is, this word is really challenging the scientists also to think. If that stick with me. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is a, a very interesting, you know, words or verses that I found by reading a very ancient text by a very famous Indian teacher who is said to have invited two times to come to Tibet and couldn't visit Guha Garba, Rabu Sanji Samwan, where he says, so there is a challenge in the sense this this Guha Garba, a great scholar, you know, of the eighth century, where he says, wherever you are born, in the low state or high state, in any of the six realms, the one that is most powerful is the inborn awareness, the mind, which is like the king. The knowledge of the substance, knowledge of the material, is a poor knowledge. And knowledge of the mind is a rich knowledge. Therefore, you should thoroughly understand the mind. Thank you very much. Oh, may I ask you to take five minutes to respond? So I have uh, five minutes to respond to every uh, question about uh, metaphysics, physics, <laughs> philosophy, oh, self-transformation, and so on. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, metaphysics first. Uh, you are right, first of all, because um, in, at the beginning, um, science and philosophy were not distinguished uh, in, in ancient Greece. And they progressively separated by a separation between the issue dealing with uh, the objective world, namely things that are completely <laughs> devoid, that we artificially devoid of any element of our subjectivity, and on the other hand, issues dealing with self-transformations. Both of them were treated in Greek philosophy. Now, what about physics and metaphysics? Uh, you know, the, I, I may qu quote Einstein, Einstein said once, uh, famously, in a, in a letter to Erwin Schrödinger precisely, he said, physics is a kind of metaphysics. Why? Because physics aims at understanding the nature of reality. Okay, uh, until now it's, it sounds very, very um, ambitious, too ambitious. But then Einstein is, was full of humor and he finished his sentence this way. He said, okay, physics aims, to, uh, aims at uh, disclosing the nature of reality, but reality, what is reality? It's only what is described by physics. So we have absolutely no clue of what can be, uh, what can be reality <laughs> apart from what we try to say about it. So things are very much more involved than we believe usually. Uh, secondly, secondly, well, oh, I will go through uh, some of your questions, but on, not all. The problem of the cat, you said, um, according to 
The standard interpretation of quantum mechanics, the cat, after this famous experiment with poison, is both dead and alive. It's a, in a kind of superposition. But this was exactly what was criticized by Schrodinger. He said, it's not possible. Therefore, what we believe to be a description of reality is not a description of reality. What we believe, when, when we say the state vector of the cat is in a state of superposition, that shows that it cannot be a description of reality. It is something else. What is it? Something very similar to probabilities. And then when you say the cat has a probability one half to be alive and the probability one half to be dead. If you say that, you are no longer puzzled or, or bothered or stupefied or, and so on. So, in fact, this cat experiment was precisely meant by Schrodinger to be a re what we call in Latin a reductio ad absurdum of this idea that in quantum mechanics described faithfully reality as it is in itself, inherently. So that's the reason why he insisted on, uh, on dispelling this kind of interpretation. Uh, also, you spoke of wave particle. And it's true, it's, it's the same problem. It's the same problem because you are completely uh, stunned that it is possible that something is at the same time localized like a particle and infinitely extended like a wave. It's, it doesn't fit, it doesn't work. But this is because in that case, you think in terms of absolute properties and absolute existence. If you think as Niels Bohr did, namely that it doesn't, it, it is not the case that uh, particles are both corpuscles and waves, but in fact, they appear as waves in certain contexts, and they appear as particles in other contexts. Then you understand everything, because it, you, have no, no, you are no longer combining two contradictory features. You know that these features are relative to something else that these features are uh, dependently arisen with the experimental conditions. And in this case, there is no longer contradiction. Um, okay, you said also, how can you move from appearances to ultimate truth? Is it the case that if a physicist discovers the last, most elementary particle, this particle is the absolute truth, or at least it is um, a description of it that is the absolute truth? The answer is no, absolutely no. Big why? Because in quantum physics, particles are themselves, in their numbering and therefore existence, relative to a, a device of detection. I can even show you an experiment that demonstrates this. And therefore, when you say, I've discovered the, the last particle, the, the God's particle, as some, some say, that doesn't mean that you have discovered something like ultimate reality. You just have discovered a, a new mode of relating with reality. And this new mode is more unifying than all, than all the other modes. And, um, and therefore, physics is definitely working in the realm of conventional truth, not ultimate truth. And therefore, we have to seek another way to, to get to ultimate truth. The only point, the only very interesting point of physics, especially modern physics, for the, the search of ultimate truth, is that it, physics, modern physics, dispels so many illusions about what reality is. It's not like, uh, you know, it's not like in the time of Aristotle. It's not, reality is not as Newton was thinking of. It's not like um, common sense is thinking of and so on. Therefore, uh, modern physics, even though it doesn't tell you what is the ultimate truth, it liberates you from prejudice. It helps you to, uh, to, uh, to have an, a more open mind towards something different. And 
I think one, one of these different things is precisely the, another attitude of research. No longer try desperately to, to catch the ultimate truth by a research of objective um, elements, but try to seek um, ultimate truth by, well, maybe meditation. I know that. Before I open the floor, can I ask a follow-up yeah. question? Because something you said raised a question for me. <clears throat> you said the moment one adopts a probabilistic interpretation of the quantum theory instead of the Copenhagen interpretation, there's no mystery anymore. There's, the cat has a probability of 0.5 of being alive, 0.5 of being dead. That's really only true if you understand what probability is. Um, and it doesn't exactly resolve the mystery because the probability is no longer a property of the cat but now it's a property of, um, of your judgment. And what we cared about was the cat. Would you care to respond to that? Thank you for your sharp question. Um, yes, I, I, in fact, when I answered with probabilities, it was as a mean of simplification, because I, wanted, I want to go straight to the point. But if, since you, you understood the, the flow of the difficulty of the, pro of the, of the problem in it, I, I have to go further. First of all, you know, when people use probabilities, usually it's about something that we ignore, but is already there. For instance, the cat is, in fact, living or, or dead. We ignore which one of the two possibilities is realized in nature, and we posit the probability uh, in order to, pr to predict this to a certain extent of exactitude. But in fact, things are a little bit more complicated in quantum physics because the cat cannot be said to be inherently dead or alive. It cannot only be said to be dead or alive relatively to an act of observation, if of, even of the, ca of the cat. So this kind of probability is a new kind of probability one that has never been seen before. So quantum physics is really original, but it's not original because it discloses uh, some new kind of reality that was not seen before. It's original because it's a new kind of theory of probability. And you are right. Probability usually are, is about uh, you know, our belief. We believe that maybe we'll find the cat uh, alive, maybe we will find the cat dead. So and we do, we've a weight one half on the two sides. But here again, you know, when you say it's a property of us, not of the cat, it's because you are still in this dualistic mode of thinking, which is typically of uh, classical physics. If you understand that in the same way as, as the cat is dead or the cat of, or, or is alive is relative to an axis of observation, even the probability is relative to an act of observation. Probability is just as relative as the states. I agree 100% or 0.99. But um, notice that what that doesn't do is suddenly make the problem easy. All it does is it replaces a problem about superposition with a problem about the reality of the probability. So it's sometimes possible to make something look like it's been solved when the problem has only been restated. And that's what I fear is happening here. But that's just me. Other questions, either from the days? Yes, Professor Siri. Uh, Michel, I, I have, uh, yeah, I have the following qu query. You know, uh, Schrodinger in his uh, biography, he stated Upanishads and other Indian philosophy in every paragraph. But when uh, the whole debate started with John von Neumann, E.P. Wigner, and Pauli regarding the role of consciousness in quantum measurement problem, he deliberately avoided using Indian philosophy and uh, his terminology. So uh, even being Eastern, I, I'm born in Eastern country where I believe that the philosophy transforms a person in a holistic way. So if he really believed in Indian philosophy, why he was trying to avoid to use the terminology in understanding physics itself. 
I, I did not find any historical reference from that. The last, I didn't understand the last sentence. No, because I am telling that if somebody who believes the philosophy in the Indian way, yes. then it should transform his whole attitude and uh, whole life. So if I do believe that Erwin Schrodinger, he believed Indian philosophy, then why he was trying to avoid the use the terminology of Indian philosophy in the debate whether consciousness plays a role in collapse of the wave functions and all. Okay, thank you, thank you, yes. To, to, to start with, I want to answer a short thing to, to your remark. It's true that uh, here one has replaced the problem of the, you know, the nature of the cat with the problem with the nature of probability, but at least the, nature, the problem of the nature of probability is our problem because probability is, uh, is what we do. It's much easier than a problem about, well, something that we don't know of. Well, okay, second, so it's a problem, it becomes a problem of math mathematics more than a problem of nature. Yes, okay, so uh, second point about consciousness. Um, you were right that Schrodinger didn't try to use his own philosophical views that were very much inspired from Advaita Vedanta in his physics. Almost none. He, he was reluctant to do that, first of all, because he was um, you know, diffident of the idea of mixing up two elements, one of physics and one of metaphysics, he, he was, um, you, you know, he even said a beautiful sentence. If you transfuse blood from the East in the, in the, in the circulation of the West, there may occur clottings. <laughs> uh, just because, you know, people may have, before they have enough clarity of mind to discriminate all these ideas, they may make mixtures. And sometimes, as you know, it happened. So, secondly, about the issue of consciousness. Something was said by Schrodinger in his Mind and Matter about the issue of subject and object in quantum physics. Um, he said, you know, Heisenberg and other creators of quantum physics said that the barrier between subject and object has broken down due to uh, quantum mechanics. And Schrodinger answered, oh, they are wrong because the barrier between subject and object had never existed. And therefore, he, so this is typical of the ideas that he drew from Advaita Vedanta and projected into physics. But then, the, according to him, the problem is no longer to know whether the barrier between subject and object has been broken, because it hasn't, because there is no such barrier. But to know how is it possible that from the continuum of a non-objective, non-subjective experience, a neutral field of experience, something like objectivity is elaborated. So it's a completely different problem. And I think it's a more Indian problem in, in, at the end. I want to thank Geshe Lakhtar and Professor Bitbol very much for this half hour.